All right, Acts chapter 11. And I'm going to start in the 19th verse. <coughs> Acts 11, 19. It says, Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenice and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Then tidings of these things came came unto the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch, who when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all, that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man and, and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. And much people was added unto the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch, And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught people much, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Uh, I want to really look at at the word Christian this morning. That's uh, kind of what's been on my heart. uh, It says there, I've mentioned this two or three times here lately, but I've I've not put a lot of thought into it. The disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. That word Christian is only uh, in the Bible three times. There's three times in the whole Bible. And right here was one of them. And then in First Peter he says, Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. And then in Acts he says, Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And I was kind of thinking about the three occurrences and I'll get into this deeper here in a minute. You guys bear with me. But I was thinking about the three occurrences of the word Christian in the Bible. And one of them here, you know, it's speaking of obedience and speaking of, uh, of you know, sharing the Word and sharing the, the grace of God. And then the other two are talking about suffering and, and rejection. Uh, and that's just something to look at today if you want to look farther into that later. I'm not going to preach about that. But uh, the disciples now were called Christian. And, and I wanted to... I've done a lot of thinking about that word Christian. And what the word means uh, in its very simplest form is, is Christ-like. Now, I looked that up in, in Webster's and, and I finally found a word that I disagree with Webster on. Uh, and that's, that is the word Christian. But Webster defines Christian as one who professes a belief in the teaching of Jesus Christ. Well, they profess a belief in the te- But now, I'm going to tell you this morning, you can profess a belief in Jesus Christ in the teachings of Jesus Christ and still not be a Christian. You know, uh, we need to be very careful uh, about what we profess to be and, and all this. Uh, I know a lot of people that profess to be Christians that are, are not very Christ-like at all. Uh, you know, they don't live the life of Christ. They don't share Christ. They don't do uh, any of the things that that Christ had, that they don't share the attributes, the characteristics that Christ had as He walked this earth. And I, I looked some into that. You know, I saw the other day somebody had, had posted something about holiness, and I'm not uh, not the denomination now. I'm just talking about being holy, and they'd given a, a definition of that as, as clean living, clean lifestyle, clean, 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 clean. You know, a lot of different cleans down through there. And uh, me and Roseanne were talking about that. I said, what about? The love of God, you know, uh, all those things should be a product of the love of God. They they should be produced in our life if we love God. But most of those things we can at least put on the perception of, the appearance of, without actually loving God. You know, there must first be a, a love for God. And uh, you know, we're, here we are on Mother's Day. You want to get an, an understanding, maybe just a a glimpse into what the love of God. Uh, find a good mother somewhere and look at her her love for her. Children, you know, I I thought about that as I was just kind of thinking about Mother's Day and uh, my wife back there. You know, I love my boys, and here everybody here that knows me knows I love my boys. You know, I, I'm I'm crazy about them, but uh, you know, she's she's done things for them that's made me cringe. You know, uh, she's cleaned up things that shot out both ends of them, and uh, and she's always you know she's she's always there to do for them whatever needs to be done. And I'm sitting back thinking, man, I'm so glad that she is. 
you know, or else I would have had to have done that, you know. Uh, but although, you know, you want to find just a, a glimpse of what the love of God looks like, find the love uh, from a parent to a child, a mother to a child, a father to a child. You know, you, you what you'll find there is a completely unselfish uh, love. You know, I told somebody, I may have told you guys this a while back, I never knew what it was to have a completely unselfish love for somebody until I had a child. You know, always, I've always given, I've always loved people, I've always loved my family and and all that, but I've never given anything that I didn't expect something, uh, some amount of gratitude, something back in return until I had a child. And when we, when we see that love of God, we begin to see a love like that, completely unselfish. Now, as we look at this word Christian, to be Christ-like, we have to look at what Christ was and, and what caused these disciples to be called uh, Christians here in Antioch. What was the characteristics that caused them to cause this label to be put on them? Uh, well, it says there that, that they were preaching the, the Lord Jesus. Uh, you know, they were going around, they were sharing their, their faith, their, uh, their testimony, they were preaching, giving out uh, the Word of God. Uh, and when Barnabas came, the Bible says there that uh, when he came and had seen the grace of God. Well, uh, these Christians were a, a, a great representation of the grace of God. Uh, Christ wasn't present there in the flesh. He, he wasn't, you know, he has already ascended back to the Father, the, you know, the crucifixion long uh, past and all this. But now, as, as Barnabas uh, came into that place and he saw these men and women uh, who were going out into the communities and sharing Christ with people, uh, he said, Oh, I've seen the grace of God. Well, well, you know, I was thinking about this. Uh, now, I don't want to go into detail, but a family that is, has went through a great ordeal this weekend, you know, a man uh, walked into a house and beat a, a mother and a son almost to death uh, with a baseball bat, you know. I almost killed them, and, and they're still in critical condition, all this. And uh, this man, he, he retreated back at 50 some years old. I saw this on the news. Now, 57 or something like that, retreated back to his mother's home, and uh, when the police come, he shot himself and killed himself. And as I was sitting there thinking this morning, just reading back over my Scriptures, that, oh, if there had been a representation of Christ in his life, if there had been somebody around him that could show him the grace of God, then probably he would have never went down this horrible path. But there wasn't. Evidently there wasn't. You know, if there had been somebody where he could have walked into their presence and said, I've seen the grace of God. I've seen something greater than what I have. And I see a life in them. And I, you know, they've been a representation of Christ to me. Uh, then maybe he would have turned to that rather than turning to this this other path that he t- that he took. Uh, they they were a representation, a great uh, appearance of Christ there uh, in those people. And it says that uh, you know they they hang this name on them. I don't know who named them. I don't know if it was. I don't think it was the Jews because the Jews had not yet uh, professed Christ, and for for them to call somebody a Christian really was to profess. A, a Christ, uh, I don't, you know, I, I don't know who it was. But probably the Grecians or, or Paul and Barnabas here. I don't know. Uh, but as we go through the Bible, we begin to pick out uh, characteristics, things that define uh, the life of Christ here on the earth. And you, you guys don't have to turn everywhere I go. I got a lot of places. But Galatians, he, he says, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Uh, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. Uh, you know, all those fruits of the Spirit and the, and the crucifixion, crucifying of the flesh and the lust uh, that come with the flesh, all these are, are characteristics, attributes of Christ. These are things that He possessed as He walked uh, here on the earth. And, and my really my thought has been, you know, what, by what right do we call ourselves Christians? What makes us call ourselves a Christian? All of us in here uh, probably... If, if somebody asks you, are you a Christian? Oh yes, I'm a Christian. Praise God. I hope that everybody is. But to be a Christian, you must be Christ-like. And to be Christ-like, you must possess all the attributes and characteristics that define Christ here on the earth. And as we look at these these fruits, love, joy, peace, how many of us possess just those three? You know, that's that would be a great accomplishment to possess all three of those. But then you add to it long suffering, 
gentleness, uh, goodness, faith. How many of us could say, well, uh, we're up to seven now. How many of us could say, uh, brother, I've got all seven. Uh, meekness, temperance, you know, how many uh, could add those two in there? And then uh, to crucify the flesh with the affections and lust. How many of us uh, could say, I possess all nine of those and I have crucified uh, the lust of my flesh? You know, uh, I, I mean, how many of us who call ourselves Christians uh, every single day could say, I possess all of these things that Christ possessed. By what right do we call ourselves Christian? I was praying and thinking on this, and I thought, you know, a lot of you go out and talk to people, and you start going out and knocking on doors sometimes, and you start to invite people and begin to witness to them, and and usually about the first thing that you'll begin to hear is they'll start to tell you all the things that they don't do. I don't do drugs. I don't drink. I don't steal. I don't bother anybody. I don't do these things that we've defined as as bad in our society. If that's what Christ had done, would we have ever known about Him? You know, if Christ had only been a man that that stayed in his house and and didn't drink and and didn't do drugs and didn't steal and uh, and didn't bother anybody would we have ever known about him you know would there be the the statement in the bible that that the the world wouldn't contain the books if all that he had done had been recorded it had been very simple. It would have been a one-line Bible. You know, uh, he stayed in his house and never bothered anybody. He didn't do drugs. He didn't drink. He didn't cheat on his wife. You know, all that. We, we take those things and we say, I don't do these things, so I must be a Christian. You know, we define this nation as a, as a Christian nation. Well, uh, we're about as far from that as any nation in the world now. You know, I mean, you think about what we're doing and what we're allowing and what's going on. You know, our, our children now, uh, 15 year old girls can can go and, and get a, a morning after pill to abort a baby with without uh, the parents even knowing it. You know, I've I've heard stories on Christian news channels and things like that. And uh, now in, in several states, a school counselor uh, can haul a teenage girl across state lines uh, for an abortion, and their parents never know uh, that it took place. Fifty-some million babies killed. You know, I mean, I know that we talk about abortion a lot, but folks, I mean, how much, how evil, how much more evil can you get than to kill the babies that grows in a womb? You know, this this Gosnell trial and all this. You know, they talked about him as the babies would be born alive in full term. That he would take a pair of scissors and cut their spine in two. You know, and that he would laugh about how that they were were squirming and wiggling on the uh, the table there where he had just killed. This living baby. Uh, how much more evil can can a nation become uh, when the things like I'm not saying that any of us would do that. None of us probably would uh, ever kill a child. But uh, how much evil does a nation have to become that that those things can happen and we can lay down in our beds at night and not be affected by the things that are going on? Are we Christians? Are are we like Christ? Would would Christ? Would his heart have been broken for what was going on? It was, folks. It was, and I believe it is today just as much. But you see these fruits of the Spirit, and then he talks about other things. Forgiveness was one. In Matthew he says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. Well, you know, forgiveness is one of the hardest things in the world uh, to do. You know, I mean, to truly forgive. We can say we have, well, you know, we profess that, but have we truly forgiven? Or would we pass that man on the road and uh, and kind of giggle a little bit because he's got a flat tar down there? You know, whatever it is, just a, just a foolish little example there. Uh, but to forgive, Christ was able to hang on a cross uh, and look down at the men that had nailed him there and say, uh, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You know, not only had he forgiven, them, but he begged forgiveness of the Father uh, for on the behalf of these men who had nailed him to a cross. Uh, if we don't possess that, then we are not Christ-like. Amen. Everybody's pretty quiet on me. In in Luke 22, he, he says, "For whether is greater he that sitteth at meat or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at meat, but I am among you as he that serveth." 
He was humble. He had humility. And in another place there in Philippians, he says, "...and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross." You know, in one place it talks about as they they come together for the Passover uh, that Christ got down and, and washed the feet of the disciples. He was humble. He was a he was a broken man. You know, he was always willing to take the role of the servant. He was always uh, willing to be the the lowest. And, you know, uh, he was the very son of God, folks. You you think about uh, that for a minute. The very son of God was willing to bow down uh, and wash another man's feet. You know, uh, he he was willing. He, you know, here he is. He's he's God now in the flesh, uh, but he's left the, the splendor of heaven, and he's come to a place uh, where the world hates him and wants to crucify him. You know, he has humility in his life, and he has humbleness. And, and he, he even tells his disciples, he said, "I could call uh, for twelve legions of angels, and they would take me uh, off this cross." And uh, you know, he never did that. He was willing to humble himself, and he was willing uh, to be the least in the whole world at that time. He was uh, he. He's the only man that's ever recorded in this Word of God uh, where God Himself turned His face from Him. You imagine the, the, the being the very Son of God hanging on a cross uh, and having to cry out, Father, you know, why hast Thou forsaken Me? He's the only man in the, the world that was ever completely forsaken for a time by the Father in that, in that manner. He was willing to humble Himself. A lot of us, you know, the the Bible deals time after time with pride and, and being exalted in ourselves and being puffed up and and all this and and Christ Himself was humble. If we don't possess that, then we're not Christ-like. I mean, I, <laughs> it's just the truth, right? It's just the truth. We, I mean, we have to deal with this because, and I'll tell you why. I said this the other day, but Clint Dennett had said it. He said that we we don't believe in evolution, but we've I can't quote how he said it, but you know we've taken on a belief as of the evolution of the believer. Just come to church long enough, one day you know you'll eventually become a Christian. That's not true. You must be born again. There's a birth. There's a you know a salvation has to take place. And that salvation will produce these things in your in your life. These are not things that have to be taught or have to be learned or have to be uh, practiced over years and years. These are things that come with the life of God. As we seek uh, the face of Christ, then all these things should be uh, added unto us. You know, these th- these are things that God uh, places in our lives, and these are things that we become. I'm not saying you'll get there uh, week one or week two, you know, but I, I'm saying that you, you know some of us, I, you know, looking around here today, and I. I don't want to pick on anybody, but you know I see people in here that's been Christians longer uh, than I've been alive, and and I you know a lot of a lot of good people here this morning. I love uh, everybody here, but I wonder how many of you would be nervous if we pulled our Bible trivia cards out, you know. I'm, I can't answer them all either, but we should know about God. We should know God. He had compassion. You know, you read in Matthew 9, He says, But when He saw the multitudes, He was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. And in Mark 1, it says, And Jesus, moved with compassion, put forth His hand and touched him and saith unto him, I will be thou clean. This was a leper. A leper. A man who had the most feared and dreaded disease in existence at that time. And Christ, you know, I've given this before, but as this man walked through the streets, he had to cry out, unclean, unclean, everywhere that he went. And there was a leper calling him off somewhere. And the only people that would associate with a leper was other lepers. Nobody who was who was whole would touch a leper. Nobody would get close to him. Nobody wanted to breathe around them. But Christ as he come through, and this man came and, and said, "Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean." And, and Christ, uh, more than just healing him, more than just saying, "I will be thou clean," uh, the Bible says that he was moved with compassion, and he touched him, and he touched him. Do we have compassion? Do I mean, if we don't have 
compassion as Christ had, then we are not Christ-like this morning. You know, by what right do we call ourselves Christians if we don't have uh, the attributes and characteristics of Christ? If we're not Christ-like, by what right do we call ourselves that? He, he fed the hungry. He touched the lepers. You know, He sought them out. You, you, you read about places that He went. He, he crossed the sea uh, to get to a man who, who was possessed uh, by demons. You know, Legion, he's up here in the tombs. Uh, he's up here cutting himself and all that. You know, and, and he, he, uh, Jesus crossed the sea just to come to this man. No other reason. He didn't do anything else while he was there. Uh, he came over there and he said, uh, you know, Legion comes to him. You know, what have I to do with thee, O Son of God? Son of... I can't remember how he said it, but Christ sought this man out and he cast these demons out of him. Uh, in one place, Christ says, I must needs go through Samaria. He goes over there and He finds this woman at the well. And He talks to her. And, he, and, and before He leaves her, I believe uh, she, has, uh, she has given her life. She's, she's given herself wholly to the, the work of God and the love of God. And she begins to profess and she begins to go through that community and tell everybody there what Christ has done in her life. He had no other reason to go through Samaria than to reach that one. Why? Because he had compassion. He had compassion. We look out our windows and we see our lost neighbors and and all that kind of stuff. And you know maybe they're doing something that we don't enjoy very much or something like that. And we just pull the blinds and we say, man, you know I wish the law would get them or or something like that. I wish they'd move to another neighborhood somewhere else. And we never have compassion. If we don't have compassion as Christ had, we are not Christ-like. Obedience. It says in, in Matthew 26, and when he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Lord, if there's any other way, I just soon not die on that cross. But nevertheless, nevertheless, not as I will, but as Thou wilt. Lord, if it takes me dying on that cross, just put me on it. Lord, if that's what it takes, I'll lay there on that cross. I'll be obedient unto death. Unto death, folks. Not, you know, God deals with us to get up and walk across the church and, uh, and pray for somebody or to uh, speak just a kind word to somebody or to get up and uh, maybe, you know, sing a song or, or say a word or whatever it is. Uh, and we, we resist that because we don't want to be looked at uh, by everybody else in the congregation. We don't want to look foolish in the eyes of the congregation. Uh, but Christ said, Lord, if it takes it, I'll lay on that cross and let them nail me right to it and let them hang me there till I die. If we don't have obedience, then we're not Christ-like. Amen? I, I, I must have passed 40 minutes, Jeremy. I don't know. <laughs> he, he tells in Matthew 22, says, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Well, uh, Christ was a man that loved God. He loved the Father. He loved his neighbor. He, you know, like I said, he went to him. He, he sought them out with compassion. Uh, he, he was faithful to pray. He was faithful to, to give glory to his Father every time that uh, opportunity came. You know, as Nicodemus come to him and called him a good master. You know, why callest thou me? Why, why callest thou me good? There's none good but God. You know, Christ gave glory to the Father uh, to the point where he made himself nothing in the eyes of man. Praise God. You know, I know this has been kind of a hard message and probably everybody that's here every Sunday is used to it. <laughs> but maybe some ain't. But but because that we're willing and content to call ourselves by the name of Christ without possessing the attributes or the characteristics of Christ, 
We're failing. Our churches are failing. We're failing our children. We're failing our communities. We're failing our churches. You know, you take this man that that shot himself last night. If he had had just the slightest hope in his life, if he had felt like he had anywhere else to turn, he probably would have never done that. He just he, he took all that he could take, you know, and and he felt like he had nobody to turn to, no doubt. I, I don't know the man, didn't know him, you know, but I know that. Surely if there had been hope, He would have taken it. But us as, as those of us who call ourselves Christians, and, and I'm, one. I'm one. I'm guilty as anybody else here this morning. I'm not picking on anybody. Just preaching to me this morning. But because we're content to call ourselves Christians and not possess the, the, the attributes of Christ, we're failing. People have no confidence in the church anymore. You know. I mean, go out in the community and, and start to talk to people, and you'll learn that, uh, you know, well, brother so and so, he's a preacher. That don't mean nothing anymore. Don't mean a thing to them, you know. I remember back years ago, and uh, many years ago, when I was just a kid, and uh, I pick, I pick on my dad this morning. He he didn't say that. Him and another man was talking about a squirrel dog or a coon dog. I don't know what it was. I said, well, this other man told me whatever it was that he told me. I can't remember now. And my dad and whoever else it was looked at me and they said, do you really believe that? I said, well, the man that told me was a preacher. And he was. And he still is. And their eyebrows just kind of raised, and you know it didn't mean much. They knew the man outside of the church. You know, I think the other man's the one that said that. You know, that it didn't really mean much. But the the world has lost trust in the church. We we failed in a way that has caused our you know our trust to be gone. And I'm going to hush here in just a minute. And James, he, he says, <coughs> in James 1.25, says, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Now, it talks about a man here that <coughs> has heard the, the perfect law of liberty. He's looked into it. But he's not just a hearer of that, you know. All of us know how you're supposed to be a Christian. All of us know what a Christian is supposed to be. Everybody here knows that if I say I'm a Christian, that I'm supposed to be honest and I'm supposed to be pure and I'm supposed to, you know, be upright and and all that. But if I just say that I'm a Christian and I do everything that the world is doing, you know, you think about it. He said He set us apart. We're to, we're to come out from the world. We're to be separate. Now, that don't mean that you can't talk to a lost person. Now, I'm not, you know, if you're confused on that, talk to me later. But that's not what it means. But He says that we're to be a peculiar people. We're to be different from the world. You know, you, you go into the workplaces and listen to the ones that profess Christ. Listen to them talk to, about what they've done on Saturday. Friday and Saturday paints a whole different picture than Sunday. But that that can't be, you know. That can't be. Everybody, surely, I hope, surely we understand this morning that that can't be. They cannot be a Christian, you know. The Bible talks about that spring, says it can't bring forth uh, sweet water and, and bitter in the same place. They put on a great appearance, you know, well... Uh, how can they look so good on Sunday if they're not saved? You, uh, folks, I'm going to tell you, you know, the Bible talks about Satan and it says that he's able to manifest himself as an angel of light. If you could see, I know that all of us this morning have got this picture of the devil in our minds and he's a great big red scaly dragon with a ponytail and a pitchfork and, and just the ugliest thing you've ever seen. He's not. If you could see him as he is now, not later, but now, if you could see him as he is now, you would see the most beautiful thing that you've ever seen in your life. He would be beautiful. 
to your eyes. And you would think, you know, you look back into the Garden of Eden, he was easily able to convince Eve to take of that fruit. And he's easily able to convince a lot of us church people to partake of things that we should not be partaking of. In James 4.17, it says, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. All of us here this morning, I'm, I'm talking to the Christian this morning, or the one that professes to be a Christian. If you've ever said in your life, I'm, yeah, I'm a Christian, I'm talking to you and, and me. But to him that knoweth to do good, we all know how we're supposed to be. We all know that we're supposed to read our Bibles. We all know that we're supposed to pray, that we're supposed to be kind, that we're supposed to be patient, that we're supposed to forgive, that, you know, that, that we're supposed to be honest, that we're supposed to uh, be a representation of Christ. And for us to know that and not to do it, to Him, it is sin. To us, it is sin this morning if we know what we're supposed to be doing and, and refuse to do it. And we wonder why. Why is God not moving? Why is God allowing all these things to happen in our nation? Why is, you know, why does God not heal? Why does God not save? Why does He not do, answer my prayers? You know, whatever it is that you have before God. Uh, folks, I'm here to tell you this morning that God still can. Uh, he's never done anything that He can't do again. Uh, he can back you up against a Red Sea somewhere with the enemy behind you, and He can part that and let you walk across on dry land. Uh, he can do these things still today, and He will do those things uh, when He finds that vessel that is willing to take on not only His name, but His mind and His heart and His characteristics and His attributes and, and all that. When He finds that vessel, you'll see something great happen. <coughs> you'll see something wonderful around that. You guys come on and sing us a song here this morning. I'm getting ready to open this altar. It's open all the time. But I'm getting ready to, to make you an official altar call this morning. But before I do, I, I want to say this. I want you, every one of us this morning, to examine only ourselves and say, have I ever professed, have I ever said in my life that I was a Christian? Folks, I didn't scratch the surface this morning of what Christ was like. I didn't. I would have been here for months and months and years to, to have ever described Christ to you. I didn't even scratch the surface this morning of what Christ was like. Uh, but this morning, if you've ever said, I'm a Christian, and you've not possessed just the things that I've talked about this morning, then I want to beg you this morning, please, please come to this altar and pray and ask God to help you. Please do that. And if you want help, if you want somebody to pray with you, just just let some of us know. Let me know. I'll pray with you for till dark tonight if it takes it. I promise you I will. So as we stand this morning, please ask yourself, am I a Christian? Am I Christ like? Truly Christ like. Come on and pray, folks. Answer. Lonely nights I feel like There are no other friends that I can turn to. Come and pray. So Christian this morning. Let me ask yourself. First, ask, if I, do I profess that? Do I say, yeah, I'm a Christian? If somebody asked me, if somebody asked you this morning, are you a Christian? What would you tell them? If you would tell them yes, then for sure you need to examine yourself and say, do I do I possess all these things? Do I am I like Christ? Am I truly like Christ? And if you're not, you need to be praying. And, and if you are, you need to be praying. <laughs> and if you're lost, there's no hope for you until you get saved. There's no hope until you're born again. Until the blood of Christ has been applied, there'll be no hope for you. It won't matter how.
how good you are uh, when you enter into those gates and, and stand in that judgment. Uh, he'll look on you. He'll, he may not tell you every bad thing you ever done. He'll just say, I don't know you. No, I don't know you. 